Hi, welcome to The Art of Physics. I'm Art, and this is going to be Physics. Today we have on tap a field trip to Century Bowl. So hang on, because here we go to the field trip. Hi, and welcome to another episode of The Art of Physics. We're back this time. Now there's a graphic you can see about bowling. So we're going to talk about bowling today, but it's not quite the way it used to be. So in order to find out how bowling is these days, beyond what that graphic looks like, we're going to talk to Mark Voigt, because Mark Voigt knows bowling inside and out. I mean, he has time to spare today, I think, so we'll be able to talk to him. How are you, Art? Hi, welcome, Mark. Well, thank you. Welcome to Century Bowl. Love it. Um, bowling is basically a game of physics all the way from the first time you pick up the ball and uh, you throw it down the lane. There's all kinds of mechanics, your body, the ball, the lane conditions, the pin setters, the pins, the weight of the pins, and the ball return and the, the gravity of the uh, machine working the ball up to a level that it, it will shoot it back to the bowler here. That's pretty simple, isn't it? There's just 10 pins, and right. you have a 12-pound ball, and you just roll it down there and knock them all down. How difficult is that? It isn't difficult at all, except, uh-oh, there are lots of variations that can make mm. a difference in the game including the weight of the ball, the, the uh, bowling ball itself. The weight, it, the balls are pretty much 12 pounds? Uh, no, they run anywhere from, uh, we, we have six pound balls six for the, pound. the kids, all the way up to 16 pound balls for, for the adults. Yeah, but unless you can really do it, uh, you know, stick to a 12 to 14 pound <laughs> ball. Okay. And the inside of the ball has a weight block on it that, that affects how the ball will uh, travel down the lane. We call it buying a ball with, a, a, with out of the box. It's a hook in the box. That you're hook buying. in the box. Hook in the box. All right. So uh, what you see out there is uh, 10 pins. They're all lined up. Uh, the entry of the ball going into the pocket, yeah, the either pocket. from the left side or the right side, has to be such that it will carry not only the, the front pin and the next pin over, the, uh -huh. the two or three pin, but it has to be able to drive through and get the tie pin. And it's got to be at the right angle so it makes those all kick and take out all of the rest of the pins. You know all those pins by number. You know them pretty well, don't you? Well, they're all friends of mine. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. So, uh, nice. and there are some times that you leave a lot of pins out there that are very difficult to, to pick up. Oh. There's spaces between them and they call them splits. Splits. Yeah. So they're very difficult to pick up. Um, so, but, Mark, the other thing I, I noticed as I came here a little earlier, there was a big machine that came down here and it was cleaning and putting some oil down and stuff. What's going on with that? Many years ago, uh, the lanes were actually prepared by hand. Somebody actually pushed a bar down, a mop, and mopped oil on to protect the lanes. Labor intensive. Very labor intensive. And then they cleaned the lanes off once a week. They call them stripping. They've now got it, they now have a machine that does that. And I think we've got a picture of a machine around here. Somewhere. Really? We, you can see the machine down at the end there. But if it does stripping, I don't think we can do that on TV. No, you can't okay. do that on TV. Right. You're right. All right. But it's a $30,000 machine now. Oh, boy. So we went from having a mop that cost <laughs> us about $10 at a hardware store to a $30,000 machine that not only strips everything, but comes back and re-oils it with different patterns depending on what pattern you want. It's all stored in the machine in a computer. My gosh. Yeah, very sophisticated. This is a highly sophisticated yeah. thing. Well, maybe the way to do this is, could somebody knock down some of those spins? Do we have anybody that knows how to do it? I think we have a young lady back here by oh, the name Addie. of Addie. And Addie, Addie is, uh, is a uh, former state champion, high school champion, both in her freshman year and her senior year. She was a a team champion in her junior year, had a uh, full ride scholarship to Alabama A&M, and uh, uh, was a very successful bowler in, uh, in college, and she still bowls, and she's going to give us some examples. Whoa, so, let's here we see go. this. Here we go. Addie, what's your last name? Pointer. Pointer. Right. Thank you. Well, we're watching. Whoa! Okay. Fabulous. Oh, this will be fun. Now he's going to turn right. his back to her. Yes, now he's <laughs> going to watch the back half of the delivery. All right. 
Oh, it looks terrific. All right. Very good. Nice job. Very wow. good. Um, Addie uh, has sort of a classic uh, delivery. She's yeah. right-handed, so she's playing on the right-hand side of the lane. Which right. Is, which is only uh, normal. But one of the problems that you have in bowling is that you have left side and right side. There and are, the lane is crowned a little the, bit at the, times? The oil has, the oil is out there in a crowned fashion. So mm. you go from about five units of oil up to 30 units of oil in the middle. Yeah, he's looking something. at it there already. That's yep. really nice. And wow. one of the problems is, is that when you have right-handed bowlers, which is about 90% of the bowlers, what you have... Well, 11% of the population is left-handed. Yes, exactly. Okay. You would know that. Uh, being and a left, David would know it too. Being a left-hander, you're right. <laughs> and the oil pattern wears down on the right side faster than on the left side. So there's a lot of people that think that left-handers have a um, an advantage. Well, somebody said that left-handers, only left-handers are in their right minds. Uh, so I don't know how that uh, works. Eddie may know. You want to throw another one? Yeah, sure. sure. Let's have another one. I think Jason's having so much fun that... Now let's see if you can follow it. Watch this. Okay. <laughs> oh, I thought he was going to turn. Oh. Oh. Great shot. Right. Wonderful. Um, well, the, now, the, the other thing that happens is that depending on the condition will determine where the bowler will, will position themselves. Uh -huh. It works on the basis of a fulcrum. Have you gotten into the discussion of fulcrums on your uh, No, your show but we're going to get there soon. It won't uh, be long. All right. You'll see arrows that are on the lane. I see the arrows, yeah. Okay. People will bowl over those arrows. That's oh. how they identify a target. Yeah. Now, if I'm standing back here, I stand in the same place. If my ball is starting to come up too high on the head pin, I will move over a little bit, which means that I'm moving back here, which means that I'm going out further on an angle. Ooh. There's a wow. good shot. Wow, see that? Yeah. Nice job. So it's, it's all, almost everything in physics that you can imagine, all the way down to light beams and waves. I believe it. Because I the camera it. down there reads the pins, the ones that are standing. Wow. And there's a ball detector that breaks a beam that goes through and tells the machine when to when to reset. Very good. Now okay. the only difficulty we've got with this is that it's hard to watch Addy easily. Go ahead and do another one. But it's hard to watch her because of the motion. She's fast. Now watch, there's some potential energy and kinetic energy here too. Absolutely right. Oh yes. Now if you watched her hand, the ball rolled off her hand. She yeah. didn't spin it. No. Like a lot of people think you have to do. It, it comes off her hand naturally, and because of the way the ball is weighted and where her finger holes are drilled, it just naturally rolls down there and curves in, or it'll break in sharply, depending on... And the, even her foot position is really all, good. Yep, always the same. The four-step classic position. One, two, three, four. And it's... Oh. Is that the 10 pin? That is the proverbial. Ah, the 10, ten pin. pin. Yeah. Doggone it anyway. I hate it when those things stick Everybody's up. Everybody's nemesis. Well, you know, actually, Mark, we're going to insert some videos here that show slow motion bowling techniques. Okay. Uh, that will help the viewers because it's hard to uh, separate this. She does it so fast and so well that it's hard to see it. But the, we'll see the viewers will be able to catch it better from the slow motion. Are you familiar with golf and the swing schools that they'll analyze your swing on a camera? I try not to be familiar okay. with golf. Well, there is that, that similarity out there. There there are bowling instructors that will come out and photograph your wow. your delivery from a, different, a number of different angles and they'll analyze it and tell you where you're losing it. Like when wow. you're bowling and you, you're going through, if you wobble your hand at the back, it affects where your arm is going to end up on the on the front end. It's got to always be straight, and they'll they'll get you lined up and tell you what you're doing wrong. Fabulous! It's all time.
we talked more earlier about left-handed and right-handed. Of course, she's a right-handed bowler. Right. So the ball is hooking in, and it tries to hit between the one pin and the three pin, right? Correct. But left-handed bowlers try to hook it in from the other side between the one pin and the two pin. Correct. Right? Uh, we have some videos we're going to insert here that show a couple of left-handed bowlers. They happen to be very famous people. Uh, they both were presidents of the United States, Bush 41 and Obama. Oh, yeah. Both did some bowling, and we're going to insert those videos and let the viewers have a chance to see how our president and former president fared. No, no, by the way, those aren't good examples of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. It'll be fun to watch. I hope so. Yeah. yeah that's our goal. This is a very large machine. And what happens, you can't see the pins from here very well. But they come, when they come shooting off of the uh, back end here, what you're going to see is the pins when they get hit, they come swept back here. There's a ball wheel that picks it up and the ball, the pins go up here into this pan and then they go out and are distributed. So there's the ball. That comes up and it goes right down there. And here are the pins coming up over on this side. All right, there should be another ball coming in a second. And you can see the basket at the top where the pins are accumulated. As soon as she throws a spare, her spare ball, I guess that was a strike there, those will ultimately go down and be deposited on the, uh, on the ground. Oops. Watch the basket up there. It's pretty fast. Now, interestingly enough, if you get a buildup of oil on the ball, what you will end up with is a ball that slides too much. So we have rags, it's really a cleaner in here, and the ball goes through there and cleans itself off as it's going back. Perfect. So, was that ever a great field trip or what? I hope you learned a little physics in the process, but even so, regardless. So, as a result of all this, we now have the guy who's behind all this. Uh, you could call him, uh, I think you're. Are you identified as the pin head? No, or no, no, it's the head pin. Head pin, I'm sorry, I yes. got that wrong. Only my enemies call me the... Okay, yeah. well, you know, in my zeal to find out about people who are going to be on this program, I usually wind up Googling them. So I wanted to Google you. In fact, I think we have a graphic that shows that. See, I Googled you. Do you see that? Oh, yes. Yeah, I Googled you. And you know what I found? Not I found, me. I found the most... Yes, I did. <laughs> I found the most amazing things. There's a picture. And let's see if we can show that picture that I found when I Googled you. Oh. That's you. Do you recognize you? Yes, unfortunately. That's, I've got a tie on. That's sort of unusual. That's what does it, doesn't yeah. it? Now, the reason for that was you were being inducted into the Detroit Bowling Hall of Fame. So we have a Hall of Fame bowler right here masquerading as a head pin or pin head or however you say that. But in any event, I think it's terrific. So congratulations well, to thank you. you. I, I didn't get great. inducted as a bowler. I got inducted for meritorious service to the industry. And um, uh, just longevity will usually get you there. Longevity? Yes. You don't have near as much longevity as I do. It, but yours isn't in bowling. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> oh, that's a real good point. Right. Boy, wow, I'll say. You know, um, I was curious about how you ever got started in bowling. And I hope you're not going to tell me it's because you had so much time to spare. No, it no. happened by accident. Mm. I went to lunch with a friend of mine. 
uh, who I asked him what he was doing, and he said he was a consultant in the bowling business, and he was brokering bowling centers, and I said, never say this to a salesman, by the way. <laughs> I said, gee, if you run into anything interesting, let me know. Oh, and boy. approximately four weeks later, I'd put together a group, and we owned a bowling center in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, my gosh. And then we owned another one a year later, and then a third one came two years after that, and I was just an investor because I was still working at Fruhoff at the time. Oh, boy. And in, that was in 78, started. 1985, wow. we bought our first center in the metro Detroit area, and I left my uh, position at Fruhoff and got into the business full time, and that became a lifestyle for my wife, Diane, and I. Wow, that's terrific. In fact, yeah. Diane is in our audience today, and uh, so she knows all too well how that all came about. Oh, yes. Boy, I say. Um, you know, we met at Camp Michigania, and we were talking before the program about how long ago it was that we met, right. and we were undecided about whether it was 50 years ago or only 10 years ago or what, but uh, we met at Camp Michigania. We did meet at Camp Michigania, yeah. and I can remember, I don't know that I had a lot of Oh, look, there's a picture of Camp Michigania. Oh. Does that look <laughs> that familiar? Looks, yes, it does. That's, <laughs> that's our oldest daughter there. Uh, uh, we have two other da uh, daughters that go with us, two grandsons now. Uh, and I'm sorry, two son-in-laws and six grandchildren. So wow. we, uh, we are a big group that goes up there each year. Wow. And we've been going for 39 years. That is just amazing. Yeah. It's a wonderful place, and it's a great family experience. Yeah, it sure is. Wow. That's been an awful lot of fun for me, too. Good. And that's where we met yes. and uh, where we're liable to meet again in not that many days, right? No, you're right. We're going Twelve to another days. couple. Of, yeah, yeah. That's, isn't it exciting? The countdown is on. Yes, absolutely. Fact, so that'll be a lot of fun. Well, you mentioned your family, and of course your family is an interesting bunch, they're very interesting, and I've gotten to know them a little bit better myself, but I think we even have a video that you'll be able to watch of your granddaughter, Manya. You want to tell us a little about her? Um, Manya became interested in the violin when uh, Diane and I took her to a Detroit Symphony Orchestra youth concert one Saturday morning when she was three and a half years old. Wow. And she was absolutely fascinated and we took her up to see the instruments after the concert and we asked her if she wanted to play one and she said she really would like to play the violin. <laughs> and at four years old she started taking violin lessons. And uh, Boy, that's a time to do it, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And she's been playing. She's 15 years old now. She's played uh, when she was 11. She played at Carnegie Hall. Oh. Uh, she plays for the Maryland Youth Classic Symphony now, and it's really sort of exciting to see her play. It's, she's, and, and, and by the way, we've got two others in the same family. Uh, the, the next one down plays the viola, <laughs> and the seven-year-old plays the cello. Wow. So it's really a, a pretty neat little uh, orchestra. And then we've got, he's, there's a little boy that comes along. He hasn't settled on anything yet other than running around. Oh, he's looking for trouble, maybe. Right. Then I got two other grandkids. Oh, listen, we're going to uh, hear it. Yes. All the better. <laughs> Wow. 
That was a benefit that she performed at as a practice uh, for her because she was going to New York for a uh, master's session uh, with a few other uh, students with the professor of violins at Juilliard. So That's a practice session. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. You know, we cut you off a minute before. You were going to tell us about your other grandchildren. Oh. Let's hear about the rest of them. Well, I told you about the other two that are, uh, that are also musicians. They're stringing along with They're uh, that stringing group along, there. Yeah, right. yeah. And we should have our own... Uh, String quartet. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> uh, I have two others, and they are very active in, um, in uh, sports. Uh, one of them is a pretty accomplished little uh, uh, baseball player. Uh, is on an invitational travel league in uh, goes around Indiana, and he's only uh, 12, just went on 13. And the uh, and his younger sister. He's a really tall oh, guy. Yeah, he's he's yeah. as tall as his mom and my my wife. And he's <laughs> he's going to be quite a uh, character. Yeah, he's just a nice 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 young man. <laughs> and then the other one is uh, she's uh, 11 years old. And she plays soccer, soccer and softball. Uh, fairly accomplished for her age, soccer she uh, she plays in a boys' league because she's so good. So oh boy, I can see the World Cup with uh, nah, her in it. I don't, in a I few don't know years. that we'll ever get that far, <laughs> but but it's really a lot of fun to see the kids develop and, and grow. You, I've seen your kids, uh, <laughs> you know, Anne, over the course of years because I think I've known her since uh, probably about 19, the middle 1970s right, when we right. uh, started and you were on a different week with us at camp. Right, exactly. Didn't yeah. work out as well as it should have, did Well, it? no, <laughs> not exactly, but we've, we've, we've developed a nice friendship since then. Yeah, it sure has helped. Well, tell me, I know from your, our camp experiences that you're quite a game player, and I was curious about what are your favorite games. Obviously, bowling is a sort of a game. But there are other strategy games that I know that you play because we've played against you with terrible results usually. Well, I wouldn't say terrible <laughs> results. My whole goal in playing games is just to have a good time with the people. It's all social. I, uh, I do compete. I, I probably am an alpha competitor. <laughs> but I, I just do it for the fun of it. I will play against people that are much, much better than I am and uh, lose continuously, but I enjoy the competition and the social aspect of it. Well, I wondered if you would reveal any of your strategy for some of these games because uh, you're very effective. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I want to go public with all of that. <laughs> I was afraid of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, it, you know, uh, every game has its strategy, and sometimes you want to appear weak and, and come from behind, and other times you want to take the bull by the horns, and it all depends on which game you're playing. Boy, isn't that the truth. And there's always a bull involved somewhere. Yes, and if you cheat, it helps. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I know that you do a lot of is and that is you read books. Oh yeah, all the time. And I was curious about what your favorite books are. Um, I really like biographies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, biographies and historical uh, biographies of all kinds. I don't really get into fiction. so. I've read, on mo I've read books on most of the presidents, uh, the combinations of things, the, the building of the Panama Canal. Um, did the, you read the Einstein biography? Yes, did, I did. Wasn't matter. that a good one? Yeah, it was fascinating. Yeah. I read the one with all the formulas and everything in there. It was <laughs> a little bit slow reading, but I had <laughs> physics when I was in college. Uh, before Gee, I you look pretty normal. Uh, yeah. Well, I got out before it destroyed me. Ah, good. <laughs> got into good accounting. <laughs> then that didn't do it, huh? No. Oh, wow. Um, I also read things that, that are of somewhat interest. Uh, there's Malcolm Gladwell has a whole series of books. I enjoy those. And uh, the fellow that wrote Freakonomics has a couple of books. Oh, yeah. Are those are fun. good. Yeah, they're all a lot yeah. of fun. And uh, they're just interesting to read. And they're very great. They're, they're really good for making conversation. Boy, that's the truth. Now, the other thing that I've noticed is the first time we met, and you told me your name was Voigt, that already rang a bell with me because I have Voigt ancestors. Oh, are you related and to Jean Voigt also? Yes, of course. <laughs> Naturally. Everybody and a, is. And Angelina? I hope so. <laughs> uh, but what I found was that my Voigt ancestors dropped the H and they became V O I G T. And so I'm named after my great uncle, Arthur Goodwin Voigt. V O I G T. He lost the H somewhere. Somebody told me to get the H out of there, I guess, but he well, did. Well, that's really interesting because I have my grandfather's boarding pass from, uh, or, or landing pass 
from Ellis Island. Mm. And he came over and he was a VOIGT also. Oh my goodness. And somehow they added the H. They took it out of my ancestors' name and put, name it, in and put it in the ears. Absolutely. Uh, there was a game involved, Mark. <laughs> I just know that that's the way that's going to work. My gosh. Didn't realize that. Yeah, I didn't uh, think of it quite that way, but now I understand it. So, You know, um, the other thing we've talked about over the years is that in running bowling centers, you meet some fascinating people under some fascinating conditions. I don't know if the viewers are familiar with the big Lebowski, oh, and yeah. I wondered if you had uh, run across any dude Lebowskis over the years. I don't know about running across dude Lebowskis, but we've had some fairly interesting customers. All the way from the famous, Eminem was a uh, regular bowler with his daughter and his niece at one of our centers. Mm. Um, we had, um, uh, we, we had uh, several of the ball players, including um, Cecil Fielder with his son Prince. Really? Yeah, wow. way back in the uh, at sat when we had Satellite Bowl, and um, I, it's it, there's a lot of people in this area that go bowling, and it's a fun activity. So we've we sort of uh, delve into that. The funniest stories all involve our customers and our staff, and it goes all the way from the hilarious. To <laughs> the, the criminal. The, well, yes, it does. We have a we have a, a a former employee that sort of murdered her husband, who was also an employee. Ooh. I don't have enough time to tell you the story on air, but Boy, I it's will. A good thing. It's a fair. It's a fascinating story. But this is family television. You yes, know. I know. Well, then I'll 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 go to the other things. Watching kids bowl oh. is a lot of fun. <laughs> and the excitement they get out of wow. uh, coming out. And, and it's become easier for kids to bowl since I got into this, ball, this um, business because they now have bumpers, which they didn't have when we started. Really? And they you put now the bumpers into the alley, yes, into the, the uh, gutters. To keep them from going, to oh, right. going into the gutter. And for the really little kids and also for the handicapped, oh, um, right. we have ramps. Cool. And the ramps wow. allow everybody to participate. Well, let me put it to you this way. Do you have any other funny stories that you want to tell, or shall I use this as the Einstein? You know, Einstein was on this program, and he developed kind of an attitude and said that I had kind of dissed him and somehow. And so I try to give him the last word on things. Do you mind if I do that this time? Go ahead. Okay. Um, Einstein says, here's what he says about bowling. Ready? He says, a table, a chair, a bowl of fruit, and a violin. What else does a man need to be happy? Now, that's what he thinks about bowling? You know, he's quite a guy, but every once in a while he gets it wrong anyway. So I guess we all do. Probably on right. Occasion. So in any event, Mark, thanks an awful lot. I'm sure glad you could find the time to spare and uh, tell us about all this because this has just been fascinating. Um, and thank you, viewers, for watching The Art of Physics. Um, and so we will be having more programs, maybe not about bowling, because this has been a terrific one. But in any event, until next time, I'm Art Wiggins.